Hi, and welcome to another episode of Hot Takes with me, the Silver Fox. We've just had another Merlin meeting. Uh, I was on the, uh, I was on a Zoom. I was going to sound the phone. I was on a Zoom meeting uh, with uh, Leslie Roberts, uh, and we were discussing the full sort of uh, background on the PPE situation, on the the legal requirements, and then what actually happened. Uh, quite interesting, quite quite worrying that everyone at every stage tended to not want to deal with this problem for whatever reason there was. Now, um, it was quite, this is quite a long call, so I have put it together for you. Um, and we're going to go and listen to this, go through this. Um, I'm just going to present it as it is. There's a couple of little edits because of uh, we wanted to just clarify something we went back. So you, you'll notice a couple of little cut, jump cuts in there, uh, but you're, you're basically at virtually the whole, you're getting the whole of the salient point of the conversation was what I'm going to try and say. Uh, so I'm going to go in now um, and we'll do this. Uh, we'll, we'll do this so you can see the, the, the conversation. Obviously, my end only. Um, Leslie's not comfortable about being on screen. Happy to talk, happy to let her name out there. Just doesn't want to be on screen, as is her complete um, correct right uh, to do so. And of course, I respect the source. So uh, without further ado, let's go and listen to Leslie, uh, what she's going to explain about the health and safety issues over the whole of the COVID thing. Here goes. Uh, right now, um, as said, I've got uh, Leslie Roberts on the phone now. We're going to just do this meeting um, here. Just This is for a clarification effect, um, because we've been talking a lot over the various videos and things about the legalities of masks, uh, their effectiveness, uh, and things like that. So Leslie's like an expert on this. She, she's managed to gather all the information together over this period. She, of course, she was doing this at the, uh, the front end, uh, you know, on the actual caregiving end. Uh, so I thought it'd be very useful. Uh, for people to know what the baselines are, what the requirements are, and what the legalities are. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to ask Leslie, who's here now. Uh, say hello, Leslie. Hello, how are you? Right. Uh, we're going to uh, ask you this now. Can you please tell the, the viewers about basically the legality and the effectiveness of, of the masks that were issued and the masks that should have been issued and all that? So I'm going to leave this open to you now. If you'd like to take over, please do go ahead. Um, this is going... <clears throat> Excuse me, this is going to be quite a lengthy statement, so I apologise um, before I start for that. However, I'm going to outline exactly how the trajectory of this all kind of happened and where it started and where it finished. So basically, almost from day one, one of my first concerns was the mass distribution of unsafe masks, which did not protect the wearer against infectious aerosols and subsequently this organisation and this government's failure um, to do anything else. So my colleague Stephen McLaughlin, who was a medical emergency trainer, outlined his concerns to me as the accredited health and safety rep very, very early into the pandemic. I would say it was probably early April. So he spoke about... This would, sorry, this would be April 20. 2020. 2020, yep. yeah. yeah. So he outlined um, his evidence in relation to infectious aerosols and everything kind of surrounding that and what he had been taught as a medical emergency trainer. So the level of deflection, however, was the government wouldn't do this. These masks do protect us. You know, everybody was singing off this same type of limage and going back to what is a cough, what a, a cough is not an aerosol generated procedure. And yet no one would actually tell you what a cough was. So for anybody now, and I mean anybody, the unions were told, the MSPs were told, I had meetings with Willie Rennie, Ruth Davidson, Patrick Harvey, I had meetings with, um, well, correspondence with Richard Leonard's office, all of that was highlighted to politicians and to the unions, GMC, Unison and Unite back in 2020. And they were all given the evidence. So for all of anybody to come out and say now, we didn't know, it is very disingenuous. So when you look at the guidance books, you were looking at them, the Brown Book, which is attached to your Health and Safety at Work Act. And it's clearly saying health and safety law was clear and hazards must be identified through a risk assessment and any risk should be removed or reduced 
so as far as reasonably practical. Mm-hmm. However, what I found, Silver Fox, at this point was that you didn't have the opportunity to do a risk assessment because they were looking back, all these managers within GGC were reverting back to Scottish government guidance. So the law was there to support me to do a risk assessment, but I was told that it's government guidance. So I was hitting my head against a brick wall, quite frankly. So the evidence that I was giving, which had been produced by my member, Steve McLaughlin, showcased that these masks were not safe and they were not even deemed to be PPE by law. And I'll get into that in a second. So when you've got a medical emergency trainer who had much experience and knowledge in relation to what masks did and what they didn't do, it's quite concerning. So he then described to me the rationale for requiring the higher grade masks. And he explained that in great detail. And he also explained the dangers of coughing and what a cough produced and how far that cough traveled. Now, you know yourself when you were a child, your mother used to say to you, if you're coughing, get a hanky in your hand because it causes infection. Mm -hmm. So everyone knew that when we were children however long ago, and yet when it comes to the worst pandemic in our lifetime, suddenly no one seems to know what a cough was. So he also explained to me the need for extremely good ventilation. And if you listen to Dr. Christine Peters, um, she was explaining that as well, and the fact that the ventilation within the hospitals was also cut, you know, was art in part almost of this because a lot of hospitals you couldn't open windows and the virus was just kind of circulating. So the, sorry, the, was, the the lack of opening windows that I've seen this before because they say that that is actually um, a health and safety issue, isn't it? Not yeah. having windows open because they don't want people falling out of them. But it, yes. it just it evades common sense. Why wouldn't you have an open? You know what's the word they have? It's like latched windows where they can open up you know, that much kind of thing. Well, you're looking at hospitals like, um, now I don't know, I, I cannot speak for any other hospital that I have not been in, so I'm not going to judge mm. that. But looking at Inverclyde Royal, I understand why the windows don't open because it's a high tower block. The last thing you want to do is somebody to somehow get a window open more than it should be and then the patient's out there. But right. It, 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 it just defied common sense mm-hmm. that windows, you know, could not be open in various circumstances. Yeah. Even smaller hospitals who had windows that didn't open that had this kind of ancient almost ventilation system. So that yeah. was a, a massive part of it as well. Yeah, I was going to say, because so, that, that, that would concentrate like the any infection because it's not being able, allowed to release, is it? So you you're getting a higher concentration of any, you know, potential harm in the atmosphere. It, it, yes to that. But at the same time, I understand that opening a window wasn't going to take it away completely. No, no. However, they continually spoke about ventilation. I mean, you heard that. They were trying to cut off yeah. bottom of doors. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that was, I, I was astounded when I heard that. What, what on earth does she think that's going to do? I have... You know? No idea. No idea. I have no idea. No. I mean, the, the sensible thing in classrooms, get the windows open. Um, <laughs> but no, they, they chose to go down. Anyway, we'll, we will not judge them for no, no, that. No, no, that's a... For that. Um, they just made a that's real, That's them. another video on another day. <laughs> yes. Um, I do not work in school, so, so I cannot no, judge. No, 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 no. <laughs> trying to cut. Um, doors off but if you listen to Willie Rennie in some of the videos it's quite comical but anyway from day one they Mm -hmm. had put a company in place called Nerve Tag now they were saying they were employed to report on the scientific findings and they noted almost immediately that their findings were weak and advised the professionals as nurses should be doing their own risk assessment regarding their own personal situation and reporting to the NHS, the findings of such. However, 
when we did our own risk assessment, personally, you know, I need a, a bigger mask. It's like someone doing a risk assessment close, uh, crossing a road almost. Um, yeah. We realised that we needed the, the, the higher grade mask, and yet we were not given it because they were deeming that we didn't need it, and yet we did. So it was quite incredulous, really. The evidence was apparent. There was much documentation on the HSE website about the need to higher grade mass in specific circumstances and a full explanation as to why. I genuinely do not believe that members um, you know, were protected in any way. We were not doing the job safely or within the remit of the law when on the health and safety um, at work sorry, on the Health and Safety Executive website, there was a report clearly outlining that surgical type 2 and surgical type 2R did not protect you. So it, 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 was, quite, it was quite incredulous, is a good word for it. Um, a favourite excuse was the health board, we are just following national guidance. However, no one was actually following national guidance since every edition of the IPC guidance that I have seen was prefaced by an absolute requirement that the duty holders must also comply with their duties under the Health and Safety at Work Act. 1974. So that, right, so that was right. That was like line one, page one. Was here's some guidance, but right on the front of that, you still, regardless of the guidance, you must still follow the law. Yeah, but they didn't. But they just sort of ripped that page off, presumably because money. I do not know what the rationale for this is. Because I, I, I'd imagine those higher grade masks would be not just a little bit more expensive. I'd imagine it would be significantly more expensive per mask, you know. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, how do you put a price on a lay? You can't. There's literally no price, no. So by providing surgical type 2 and surgical type 2 are as PPE to protect the healthcare worker for inhaling airborne virus, they were in breach of COSH Regulation 7, subsection 9, as qualified by the COSH Approval Code of Practice and HSE guidance on RPE, which specifies a minimum protection factor of 20. Mm -hmm. So that is what is outlined in law within the Brown Book and the Health, Safety, Health and Safety at Work Act. So therefore, FFP3 respirators or equivalent, and in America, I believe it's N95, for yeah. protection against a microbiologist hazard, you needed the higher grade PPE. Mm -hmm. So as you're well aware, legislation in the form of statutory instruments takes precedence over guidance in any hierarchy of legislative members, me, sorry, measures. Yes, put yes. More simply, yeah, the, the law is primacy, yeah. Put more simply, law trumps guidance. Yeah. And yet it never. So you had all this Scottish government guidance, which should have been superseded by law, law, and mm -hmm. yet it wasn't. So... The IPC guidance was dictimonious. On one hand, it specified that fluid-resistant STTR must be worn when providing close-quarter care of infectious patients. But these masks are not and have never been defined as PPE in the UK and they most certainly not, do not protect against the inhalation of airborne particles, whether mm -hmm. that be dust, fibres, airborne droplets such as aerosols. Mm -hmm. The fact that healthcare workers were literally duped into believing that these flimsy masks actually protected them is quite frankly the biggest scandal this country has ever faced. Furthermore, You've got the health and safety executive who simply ignored their own documented evidence and also duped the workforce into believing that surgical type 2R masks actually protected them. 
Further evidence regarding all of this was on the Dental Association website and other professional websites, which illustrated the very same thing. Again, the evidence was clear. It was concise that these masks did not protect the wearer against coronavirus or infectious aerosols, and they were not deemed to be PPE under the law I have just spoke about. And so, yet, but, but they were telling, excuse me, <coughs> they were telling people that they were, so they were in fact just lying, just outright yeah. lying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was blatant lying. Now, what I've just read you out was the grievance that I raised in July 2020. That was my exact words within a 130 page grievance. Mm -hmm. And um, to, to whom did you send that grievance? That got sent to, um, I, I have sent that information to everybody. Oh, right. That so it's, it's universal. It, it's out there for all. Yeah. Well, I have sent it to, I had sent it to Jean Freeman, Willie Rennie, um, Patrick Harvey, Ruth Davidson, um, every single politician yeah. who was the leader of a party. Yeah. So it's cross party me. and cross organization as well. Yes. You mentioned or, uh, you, trade unions and things. Yeah. So, yes. so all basically ev everyone who was a stakeholder or who, who had an interest. Yes, everybody yeah. said that information um, and can't say the way because there is a there is an email trail that yeah, Unison yeah. were told, GNC were told. Um, I contacted everyone who I knew and I gave them the information that I had. And yet we were being told, these masks protect, yeah, they do. And you've now got a massive amount of care workers who have been exposed due to unsafe PPE and have went on to take long COVID, um, other related illnesses um, due to not being given the proper PPE. And it, it, it's just crazy. We were sent in to our desk. They created a death trap when yeah. the, the law was in place to protect us. Now, what then happened was that Unite the Union who I was a member of, I was a rep with, um, General Workplace Health and Safety and Equality and Diversity, um, under the Employment Rights Act 1996, parts 44 and 100, give the worker the legal right to walk away from hazardous duties, but yet did not actually tell the workforce what the hazard, is, what, what the hazard was. So surely sense should have prevailed that everybody said to the workers, we know these masks don't protect you and we are giving you the opportunity to walk away. But mm -hmm. no one actually told the workforce. And I had raised it time and time again um, within the union itself, within the health board, within the government, within the mm -hmm. Mental Welfare Commission, within the Care Commission, within all these public funded organisations saying to them, your workers are not protected. Now, a lot of nurses could have been perfectly fit and could have been carriers of that virus and took it home to perhaps the elderly parents if they lived with their yeah, parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or children if they lived with their children. Um, or we're just spreading it about the general patient populace yeah. almost. I mean, it, it's your contention, isn't it, that it was a it was a hazardous environment yeah. and that they knew it was a hazardous environment yeah. and they failed to give you the proper equipment to be safe within that environment. Yes, they did. Yeah. Now, that, to yeah. me, is... Um, that sounds like an offence straight away. Well, it's, it's, it's part of other yeah. evidence yeah. I yeah. brought forward. Yeah. Oh, no, I know. And it's part of the bigger picture. But even if that was all there was, that itself, I think, would be an offence. So it's no wonder you were complaining. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, well, I'm interrupting. Please carry on. Right. But it's, it's just I, I wanted to give a bit of feedback at each point because I, where I think something is important, um, I just wanted to sort of highlight that. That's why I was sort of mentioning it. But obviously, still, please do carry on. Right. So due to the concerns and the specifics of what was being raised. I felt it was imperative that I took the time to speak to my members, which I did, who I directly represented. I mm -hmm. also spoke to a number of people who I felt needed some support, 
um, whatever, you know, and as a rep, yes, I was legally, you know, I, I was legally bound to um, represent them in the way that should have been represented. Um, however, yeah. if anybody else came to me with questions, I would try and answer them as much as I could within what I knew. Yeah, within well, your area of expertise, yeah. But yeah. I wouldn't say it was... I, I was a, I was a rep. Well, you, you were qualified to do it, Leslie. You were qualified to do it. And therefore, within your qualification, you would be deemed an expert within your qualification. Well, I, cert I certainly went through um, Unite with Unions training, yeah. and I went on to do another diploma myself. So I've got two yeah. diplomas in health and safety and equalities. Due to the number of concerns and specifics that were being raised, I felt it was imperative that I took time to speak to members that I directly represented. Mm -hmm. I duly did this under Section 29 of the Act, which gives the Health and Safety Rep specific guidance under law mm -hmm. to what to do. So yeah. I kept myself reasonably practical. I took all the reasonable practical steps to keep myself informed of the following. The legal requirement relating to health and safety of persons at work, particularly the groups of persons that I directly represented, mm -hmm. and the particular hazard of the workplace and the measures deemed necessary to eliminate and minimise the risk of deriving from these hazards. So part of my role was representing the workers in talks with the employer or the health and safety executive or other safety environmental enforcement agencies. I had the legal stance and right to do that. When I then spoke with my employer, they took 13 months to go through a grievance about unsafe and unlawful masks. The HSE received nine emails from me and answered one, keeping to the view that these masks were appropriate and safe. I then spoke to Jean Freeman, who did the same. Well, I never spoke to her. I wrote to her, who did the same. Willie Rennie also wrote to Jean Freeman, who did the same. And Willie Rennie was concerned enough that he also wrote to the Lord Advocate. And I have a copy of that later. I also had the right to investigate complaints of possible hazard and dangerous incidents. I had the right to carry out regular inspections of the workplace and I had the absolute given right to take part in workplace risk assessments by mm -hmm. law. However... And, and, and did you do that? Did you actually do the, the risk assessments? No, because they, they... when I asked for a risk assessment to be done mm -hmm. surrounding masks, I was told there were no risk assessments because they were reverting back to Scottish government guidance. Mm -hmm. So, ridiculous. So you, you, so you, so you were actually effectively banned from doing a risk assessment on a product you knew wasn't PPE, the same product that the HSE said was acceptable, that Gene Freeman says was acceptable, even though you knew in law it wasn't. Yes. Wow. Okay. And you weren't and you weren't even you weren't even allowed to query it effectively. Well, I have a chain of emails um asking to be part of risk assessment and I have I, I, I have produced them as well to mm -hmm. somewhere other than here. And there is an email chain that they are reverting back to government guidance, which stated that unsafe and unlawful masks were indeed safe when they yeah. weren't. When they and were. that's how you've now got mass nurses with um, long COVID. It comes down mm. to them. The accountability lies yeah, squarely yeah. at their door. They, they, they've put they put these nurses, including you. I mean, obviously, all the ones who haven't got it, but they were still exposed to a hazardous environment without yes. the proper equipment. Yes. Um, totally in contravention of the law. Yes. And ultimately, Absolutely. and ultimately, this will be a decision by. Middle management, senior management, government ministers, all the way up the chain, isn't it? All yeah. the way to probably to the very, very top. I mean, so, when we certainly, had... I was going to say, certainly as high as Gene Freeman, but even would it be even above that to, to Sturgeon, you know? So. Well, 
she stood on the podium every day saying that she was ultimately accountable. So let's make her. Ultimately. Let's make her. <laughs> yes, she's opened that door. She's, yeah. she's opened that door. So that is why I have raised it with the police, yeah. which I will not go into the criminal case. No, 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 because you, you stand away from that. Yeah. Um, I have raised it with the code of conduct because I believe she lied. And mm -hmm. by writing two other MSPs, yeah, we believe that these are safe. She was not working in line with the code of conduct. She lied. She misled Parliament. So therefore, and then I had the whole thing that that vote to be done last week that you know you're accountable, but you're not accountable. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So the employer has the legal duty to consult the safety rep about anything that may affect health and safety in the workplace. Instead of doing that, what did they do? They come after me and try to target my clinical role to silence me as a rape. And we've went over that. I've just paid out yeah. compensation. Yeah. And yet no one's done anything wrong, of course. They tarnish um, your name to try and hide your your truth, if you will. They're hiding the truth by, by basically shooting the messenger. Well, basically what they were doing was trying to jeopardise my clinical role and yeah. when I was acting as a rep, you have the Employment Rights Act 1996 to protect you to do that role. What they were then trying to do was target my clinical role mm -hmm. and make out as if I was acting nursing misconduct issues mm -hmm. when I was actually acting as a rep. That's illegal. And that's why yeah. we had to pay compensation. Yeah, because you were wearing a different hat, weren't you? It was, uh, yes. Well, yeah. what they actually paid the compensation for was GDPR breach. Because they were listening in to phone calls. That's right. Yeah, phone we've calls. covered we've we've covered that yeah. before. We've covered yeah. that. So, so the, what by law they have to do is consult the safety net by law, and allow them to chance to state their views. Now, by all accounts, I was I was stating my views when I raised this grievance back in the summer of twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. Unsafe mask, unsafe goggles, this, that, the other, everything that was within that entire um, grievance. And yet, they didn't really want to hear that, did they? No, they no, because that, that flies in the face of everything they've said, and we all know that the SNP can never, ever be wrong. No. So no. then you've got the employer must account of these views when making a decision. So the employer must consult on changes within the working practice or procedures that could affect your health and safety. Did they do that? Arrangements yep. for using qualified people to help the business comply with health and safety legislation. Did they do that? They did not. Information to be made available on health and safety risks in the workplace. Planning they didn't do that either, did they? <laughs> planning and health and safety training and health and safety issues with new technologies. So if the employer does not consult as the law requires, they are then committing an offence. Mm -hmm. So under the law, a safety rep is protected as a whistleblower if there has been criminal offence, breach of legal obligation, miscarriage of justice, and I put this one in bold, a danger to the health and safety of any individual. Damage that's, a, to the that's primacy, isn't it? That's the number one, the health and safety of individuals. Never mind the breaches or a technical breach here or that. Ultimately, it's human beings that are the most important at the base of yes. this. Yeah. Yes. And deliberate covering up information about all of these, which I believe... Oh, oh definitely did. did. They definitely did, yeah. So if the employer doesn't follow health and safety regulations on consulting a safety rep, <laughs> they are not working in line with the law. Breach of, yeah. Breach of regulations, yeah. Rep that the safety rep should then follow the grievance procedure as set out by the contract of employment. And yet when I, as that safety rep, who was getting targeted, intimidated, bullied, everything into silence, raised a grievance, it took 13 months to come to an unsatisfactory conclusion. And the trajectory... But of unsafe mass is continuing to this day. Right, Leslie, uh, I mean, 
First of all, 13 months, way, way too long. That should be no more than three, four weeks, really. They should get that, look at that, something that serious, something that big, that should be turned around very, very quickly. Well, when a collective grievance is um, raised by health and safety representative of legal standing and the collective members, it should surely have been heard in line with their own process but it wasn't it was procrastinated over until they could you know it, it till they possibly could not have went any slower if they tried mm -hmm. i then found out at the very end now the way the process goes within the health board is you have something called an early resolution um process then you have a first level grievance a second level grievance then it goes to board level mm -hmm. a board level grievance does not have to adhere to a time frame so when I raised that, a date was set for July and it had to be cancelled because someone was unwell. Mm -hmm. They then never set a date to September. So it was a further two months. Yeah, I can say another two okay. months, yeah. So, I, I, I mean, it just, it, it, it was unbelievable. I always knew that the health board were a bad employer. They were a terrible employer, but I never, ever imagined that it was quite as bad as what it was when you opened up Pandora's box. So anyway, going back to the health and safety executive. Due to my position as a health and safety rep, it was in the remit of my role to contact them. Evidence will then show that when I challenged them in numerous occasions, they chose to simply ignore all of the documentation that was sent to them. Mm -hmm. So I received a letter back from them on the 23rd of September 2020, basic response. And basically what it said was, fluid-resistant surgical mass, FRSM type, surgical type 2 R, STTR, must be worn when? Must be worn with eye protection if splashing or spraying of blood, bodily fluids, secretions, or excretions into respiratory mucosa, nose and mouth. Mm -hmm. Or be <laughs> worn when delivering direct care within two metres of a suspected or confirmed COVID-19 case. So there you have the HSC knowing in 2009 that there was a, a report on the <clears throat> on their own website saying that these masks were not safe when working with people with coronavirus. Hold on, so they'd actually published that data on their own website and yeah. now were gainsaying what they'd previously said themselves? Yes. Oh, that's stunning, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> the, the website, was, it was a report that was written by four individuals. Um, can find you the details of, if required. I think Sunday Claymore rings a bell, but the four of these individuals were clearly saying, now I used that in the documentation mm -hmm. back to the HSE, and I said, but your own report is stating differently. Here's what your report is stating. But they just went back and said, a cough is not an aerosol generated procedure. And Which is against <laughs> all common sense because it quite clearly is. Well, it isn't, David. And, and that is where... How is this? It, sorry, maybe I'm mistaken. How is coughing not aerosolizing fluid from inside you? No, that's not what I'm saying. What they were saying. Oh, they're saying it is not. Oh, cough. right. Okay. Yeah. We all know it they is, were, but they were saying it wasn't. Yeah. Well, what they were doing, you would say to them, what is a cough? And they would tell you what a cough wasn't. Yes. A cough is not an aerosol generating procedure. Mm hmm. So I would then go back and say, yes, I know it's not a procedure, but what is a is cough it? itself? They refused. They refused. We've covered this before. They absolutely yes. refused to refused. define it. Yeah. Yes. It was going back to the language of a cough is not an aerosol yeah. generated procedure. And you would hear that time and time again when whoever was standing on the soapbox was giving yeah. their deal on the soapbox. Um, so... That's what you were up against with the HSE as well. So it, it was just absolutely unbelievable that their own website was saying different. And 
sometime later I will go into Riddle recording and mm -hmm. what they done as well with downgrading. But what they done as well was they downgraded the virus itself from a hazard link four to a hazard link three. What's and that, the, sorry, what's the difference between a four and a three? Well, that is something that I would be more than happy to go into. And well, you, you can cover this in another video. It's a, but it's it basically four is a very much more serious one than a three. Is that it? I've not touched on this actually yet at all. I don't think a hazard definition table is a group one to a group four. Mm -hmm. So each hazard group outlines all the specifics within what the legislation states. Right. So okay. A but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a I'm saying it's a level of severity severity isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we can we can we can look at that in another video. We won't go into it now because otherwise yeah, we're okay. sort of getting that's distracted fine. off the main main topic there. That's fine, but that is a very 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 significant part yes, yes. of the failures within this. And by looking, tell, they, they were constantly telling us how serious it was, and then they're downgrading it for whatever reason they've decided. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Okay, they did. Yeah. This was the worst pandemic that we had saw in almost 100 years, perhaps even more. Mm -hmm. And at a time where lessons were supposed to be learned about asbestos and the requirement for legal protection for the workers and the Act being in place to support that, that Act and all other Acts regarding DNA CPRs and everything that happened with the care homes, all the various acts were superseded by the Scottish government guidance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the law was there to protect people, there to protect the elderly, the vulnerable, the disabled, the workforce, anybody who fell into the bracket of mm -hmm. protected characteristics should have been protected. And they weren't. They weren't. No. They weren't. And the most vulnerable in society, as well as the care workers, everything involved in that, were li literally, they created death traps, and that's why. And then at, at some point in the future, I will go into how they dealt with um, reporting of specific things, like riddle reporting, like detexes, and how all of that was downgraded as well to allow for an absolute death trap, and that's exactly what and that's why I have taken it to the lens that I have. And for which everyone is extremely grateful. Uh, I don't know if you've been looking at the comments on the videos and that, but the support for you is immense. It's absolutely immense. There's not one, there's not one single comment that is against what you're doing. Not a single one. It's an amazing thing. Never seen anything like it. Thank you. Because I, I, I believe that human life, I mean, you, you see all this about, investigating finances and whatever if you do not support human life you've That's lost, your, you've you've lost, lost your, moral. your moral you have it is it's an it's a massive ethical problem yes, i don't think i honestly don't think the smp have got much by way of ethics but that's a personal view i can't really express my personal view it's your video but i do think that they they certainly prioritize other things above human safety i'll put it that way I believe yeah. so. Anyway, Leslie, thank you very much for taking the time out <laughs> to speak to me today. All sure, right. the I'm sure everyone who's watching this will thank you as well. Uh, so I'll speak on their behalf and say thank you very much. Uh, and I'm going to let you go because I know you've got a very busy day today. Uh, so we'll 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 hook up again and do the next video when you're when you're able to do that. Uh, we'll go through that. But for today, thank you very much. You've been very very um, informative today. You've, you've you've nailed everything that needed to be said. You've shown us what the laws were uh, and how they were basically ignored, hidden, uh, how you were sort of driven away from being even able to assess, do safety assessments or anything like that. And it's, it seems deliberate on purpose and for whatever motive um, it may be. But anyway, we're there. Yep. Thank you. And until the next video, thank you for coming and goodbye. Thank you. Take care. All right. So there we are. Um, I want to give my absolute heart, heartfelt thanks uh, to Leslie. Um, she's worked so incredibly hard for a long time 
to get all this evidence together to back it up. So he's got evidence, and then she's got evidence to back up the evidence she's got. She's got everything there. She's got all her ducks in a row. She's got the sources. She's got copies of things. You know, she's she's really put so much effort into it. It's um, a dedication that um, deserves seriously uh, a lot of respect, applause, uh, and we we need to uh, all stand one hundred percent behind her. And I can I can honestly say, as I look at this and the people watch and all the comments, um, it seems that you good viewers out there in YouTube land are indeed standing 100% behind her. So uh, thank you all, and thank you all for watching these videos. As you watch them, the truth comes out. And there's more to come, there's, there's, there's a lot more information. But every bit that comes out, more people are watching, more people are seeing, and the truth comes out. And it's the one thing that will utterly destroy the enemy, is the truth. And the enemy, of course, is the SNP. Because they are enemies of humanity um, at the end of the day. And so as the truth goes out, and as more people know about it, more people clamour for the truth, more people clamour for a resolution. Uh, and that's what we're there for. Um, I'm going to bring it to an end here. Uh, but I will just say that there was a little thing. We had a conversation uh, off, off Zoom, if you will, just before you know, I let her go there. And um, apparently, and this is... This is something I'm actually quite stunned at, and I, I, I'm like, oh, wow. Uh, is that um, obviously you've seen these videos, but apparently um, Jackie Bailey uh, has seen these videos too and has been in conversation about them. I'm not going to say at this point with whom, it's someone pertinent to it. Uh, but yeah, when you get Jackie Bailey watching the videos, I just to say, like to say, thank you for watching, Jackie, or Dame Jackie, thank you. Um, if you feel obliged, do please contact me. I will be more than happy to give you uh, an interview and you can say exactly what you like uh, on the channel. Um, and I do think that if you were to join us in trying to push for the truth, that would make everything a lot easier. Anyway, I'm going to stop there because this is, this is Leslie's video, not mine. Uh, so, uh, again, okay, one, one last thanks very much for Leslie, to Merlin, as we called her. Uh, and we wish her well and uh, hope that the rest of the day goes a lot easier. Um, so thank you very much for watching. If you like what you see in here on the channel, do please subscribe. And I would ask, do please subscribe. Keep watching these. Keep sharing these. It's important these are shared. We need, this is the most massive truth. And we need it to get out to as many people as possible. So if you're on social media, share the hell. Get people watching. Get people asking. And get people angry. And let's get this sorted. Let's make sure that the people responsible do the necessary time in jail for the harm they've done. Anyway, until next time, stay safe, stay well, and goodbye.